This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 45. Coming up on Space Time. A new address for the Milky Way, heavy rains on Mars, and how the Square Kilometre Array will change forever the way we see the universe. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The light-scale structure of the universe looks a bit like a giant cosmic web with long filaments and connecting nodes made up of galaxies, galaxy clusters and superclusters, all of which surround vast empty voids. And until now, astronomers were fairly sure that our galaxy, the Milky Way, was located on one of the web's outlying filaments, not far from a void, but definitely not inside one. Now, a new study may have turned that view of our cosmic web upside down. According to the new findings, the Milky Way and its immediate neighbourhood, known as the Local Galactic Group, aren't on the edge of the local void after all. We're inside it. We just didn't know it because the gigantic void's hidden from our view beyond the other side of the Milky Way. The first observational evidence for this change in cosmic address appeared back in 2013, when University of Wisconsin-Madison astronomers Amy Barger and Ryan Keenan provided data indicating that the Milky Way, at least in the context of the large-scale structure of the universe, resides in a region of space containing far fewer galaxies, stars and planets than expected. In other words, an enormous void. Now, a new study presented at the American Astronomical Society's conference in Austin, Texas, has supported the early conclusions by smoothing out some of the outstanding differences between different cosmological measurements of the Hubble constant. The Hubble constant is the rate at which the universe is expanding out from the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. Current estimates place the Hubble constant at 71.9 kilometres per second per megaparsec. It was Edwin Hubble who first noticed that all the galaxies appear to be moving away from us. And the further away a galaxy was, the faster it appeared to be receding. Although widely attributed to Edwin Hubble, the Hubble constant was actually first derived from Professor Albert Einstein's general relativity equations by Georges Lemaitre in 1927. The problem is, different scientists using different methods to try and determine the expansion rate of the universe are getting very different results. The New Studies author Ben Hershett, also from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, says no matter what technique you use, you should be getting the same value for the expansion rate of the universe today. Hershett says now that we know we're in a void should help resolve some of those issues. The reason for that is that a void with far more matter outside the void, exerting a slightly larger gravitational pull, will affect the Hubble constant value 1 measures from a technique that uses relatively nearby type 1a or thermonuclear supernovae. However, it should have no effect on the value derived from a technique using the cosmic microwave background radiation, the leftover energy from the Big Bang itself, now cooled down to just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. The new Wisconsin-Madison report is all part of a much bigger effort to try and better understand the large-scale structure of the universe. The cosmic web-like structure of the cosmos is composed of normal matter in the form of voids and filaments. Normal matter, technically called baryonic matter, involves the sort of things you and me are made out of, as well as cars and trees and boats and dogs and cats and houses, as well as planets, stars, clouds of gas and dust. Pretty well everything we can see in the universe. The problem is when combined, it all makes up less than 5% of the total mass energy budget of the universe. Two mysterious elephants in the room, dark matter and dark energy, make up the remaining 95 plus percent. Scientists have no idea what they actually are, hence the term dark. But they know both exist because they can see their influence on normal baryonic matter. Put simply, dark matter is holding galaxies together, preventing them from flinging apart as they rotate, so we can see its gravitational influence. On the other hand, dark energy is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate at an ever-increasing rate. Over time, this will change the Hubble constant. And as the universe's rate of expansion accelerates, that will change the ultimate fate of the universe and everything in it. Astronomers have named the local void containing the Milky Way the KBC void. KBC standing for Keenan, Berger and the University of Hawaii's Lennox Crow, who was also part of the original discovery. 
If the calculations are correct, the local KBC void would have a radius measuring roughly a billion light years. That's some seven times larger than the average void. Consequently, it would easily be the largest void known to science. The only place you'd find a bigger nothing would be outside the universe itself. The new analysis claims that the original estimations of the KBC void, which is shaped like a sphere with a shell of increasing thickness made up of galaxies, stars and other matter, are not ruled out by other observational constraints. Barger says it's often really hard to find consistent solutions between different observations. But she says the new findings show the density profile that Kenan measured is consistent with cosmological observables. Scientists always want to find consistency, because otherwise it means there's a problem there somewhere which needs to be resolved. Astronomers measuring the expansion of the universe usually use a specific type of exploding star, called a Type 1a or thermonuclear supernova. These occur when the stellar corpse of a sun-like star called a white dwarf happens to be in a close binary system with another star. Over time, the white dwarf gravitationally draws more and more material from its companion star until it reaches about 1.44 times the mass of the Sun, a figure known as the Chandrasekhar limit. Once a white dwarf reaches this mass, it can no longer support its own weight, and so it explodes in a thermonuclear or Type 1a supernova, a blast so bright it briefly outshines an entire galaxy. Because all Type 1a supernova explode at about the same mass, they all explode with about the same luminosity, regardless of how far away they are. This allows astronomers to use them as standard candles, sort of like cosmic rulers to determine distances across the universe. It's just like observing a bunch of streetlights along a road. The ones closer will appear brighter than those further away, even though they're actually all identical in brightness. This is known as the inverse square law, and it allows astronomers to equate apparent brightness with distance. Because all the observed Type 1a supernova that have been measured have all been relatively close, cosmically speaking, to the Milky Way, and because no matter where they explode in the observable universe, they do so with pretty well the same amount of energy and brightness, it provides a great way to measure the Hubble constant. Alternatively, the cosmic microwave background radiation is a way to probe the very early universe, just 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Photons from the cosmic microwave background encode a baby picture of the very early universe. They show scientists that the universe was surprisingly homogeneous at that stage, it was a hot, dense soup of plasma, photons, electrons and protons, showing only minute density and hence temperature differences across the sky. But in fact it's those tiny differences which are exactly what allow astronomers to infer the Hubble constant by looking at the cosmic microwave background. Hoshet says a direct comparison can thus be made between the cosmic determination of the Hubble constant and the local determination derived from observations of relatively nearby supernovae. Barger claims the new analysis shows there are no current observational obstacles to the conclusion that the Milky Way resides in a very large void. As a bonus, she adds that the presence of the void can also resolve some of the discrepancies between techniques used to clock how fast the universe is expanding and hence its ultimate fate. Earlier, it was thought that the local void was composed of three primary regions, separated by bridges of wispy filaments. Like all voids, the local void was always known to contain significantly fewer galaxies than expected from standard cosmology. Prior to this new study, our best estimates indicated the void was about 230 million light-years long and about 150 million light-years across. Astronomers believe the local galactic group, which is dominated by the Milky Way and Andromeda, actually sits in a large flat array of galaxies known as the local sheet, which is bounded by the local void. Based on those calculations, the Earth would be at least 75 million light-years from the centre of the void. That earlier size for the local void was calculated by studying an isolated dwarf galaxy located inside it. But the bigger and emptier the void, the weaker its gravity, and hence the faster the dwarf galaxy should be fleeing the void towards larger concentrations of matter along the filaments and nodes. Recently, a new three-dimensional map of the universe, developed by cosmologist Yehuda Hoffman from Israel's Hebrew University, concluded that the Milky Way is moving towards the Shapley supercluster concentration of galaxies some 650 million light-years away at more than 2 million kilometres an hour. The Shapley concentration is the largest concentration of mass within a billion light-years. As well as the gravitational pull of the Shapley concentration, Hoffman also measured the repelling vacuum energy of the void, describing it as a low-density dipole repeller pushing the Milky Way away from it with incredible force. 
Those findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, showed that the Shapley concentration and the dipole repeller imposed about equal force on the galaxy. To reach their conclusions, Hoffman and colleagues used both ground-based observatories as well as NASA's Hubble Space Telescope to measure more than 8,000 galaxies in our local cosmic neighbourhood. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study claims heavy rain on Mars reshaped the red planet's surface, carving out valleys and river channels billions of years ago. The new findings reported in the journal Icarus show that changes in the Martian atmosphere made it rain harder and harder, having a similar effect on Mars as it has here on Earth. It's already known that the red planet was once a warm, wet world with a thick atmosphere suitable for life. However, it became the freeze-dried desert we see today following the loss of its protective global magnetic field, which had shielded the planet from the erosive effects of the sun's solar wind, which is blowing away the planet's atmosphere. The new study by geologist Robert Craddock from the Smithsonian Institution and Ralph Lorenz from Johns Hopkins University takes a detailed look at the Martian rainfall, showing it was heavy enough to change the planet's surface. To reach their conclusions, the authors used methods already tried and tested here on Earth to study the erosive effect of rain as it fell across the surface of Mars. Craddock says while many people have analysed the nature of rainfall on Earth, no one's thought to apply the same physics to understanding the early Martian atmosphere. To understand how rainfall on Mars has changed over time, the authors first had to consider how the Martian atmosphere has changed. When the red planet first formed 4.5 billion years ago, it had a much more substantial atmosphere, with far higher pressure than it does now. And this pressure influences the size of raindrops and how hard they fall. Early on in the red planet's existence, water droplets would have been very small, producing something more like a fog rather than rain and this would not have been capable of carving out the geological features seen on Mars today. However, as the atmospheric pressure decreased over millions of years, raindrops got bigger and rainfall became heavy enough to cut into the soil and start to alter the landscape, carving and sculpting geological features across the face of Mars. The water could then be channeled cutting through the planet's surface, creating valleys. By using basic physical principles to understand the relationship between the atmosphere, raindrop size and rainfall intensity, the authors have shown that Mars would have seen some fairly large raindrops, capable of making more drastic changes to the surface than the earlier fog-like droplets. Lorenz has also studied liquid methane rainfall on Saturn's moon Titan, the only other place in the solar system apart from the Earth where rain falls onto the surface at the present day. He says the data shows that very early on, the atmospheric pressure on Mars would have been some four times that on Earth today. The raindrops at this pressure would not have been bigger than three millimetres across, and that would not have penetrated the soil. However, as the atmospheric pressure fell, droplets could grow in size and also fall harder, cutting into the soil. In Martian conditions at that time, had the pressure been the same as we have here on Earth, raindrops would have been about 7.3 millimetres wide. That's a millimetre bigger than on Earth. But Craddock admits there'll always be some unknowns. For example, no one knows just how high a storm cloud could have risen into the early Martian atmosphere. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. My favourite planet, uh, because that's where my favourite Martian came from, that is (laughs) Mars. And uh, some interesting new, uh, I don't know if it's a theory or if it's proven, you'll be able to tell me, that the shaping of the planet's surface may have been due to heavy rain, which is Uh, certainly happening on Earth all the time. (laughs) That's right, except it was heavier on Mars, apparently. Ah. So, yes, this is, in a sense, it is a theoretical study, and it's been made by two geologists in the United States. What they've done is they've looked at the sort of what we know of the climate history of Mars. And remember, for the first, probably the first, maybe even billion years of its life, and Mars is 4.6 billion years old, like the Earth is. But for the first, uh, perhaps, billion years of its life, Mars was a warm and wet planet, Mm. rather than the cold, dry world it is today. So the scientists have looked at the way that rain might have formed on Mars. And the reason why they're doing that is because we see on Mars evidence of rain-driven rock formations. By that, I mean the process of erosion that caused river valleys 
valleys and things of that sort here on Earth also happened on Mars. So rain clearly fell and caused these erosive features that we see, as I said, river valleys, estuaries, all that sort of thing. We believe that there was an ocean on Mars as well in the northern hemisphere. So what they've done is they've studied the the atmosphere of Mars as we believe it evolved in its 4.6 billion year history and looked at the way the rain might have fallen from that. Apparently, in the beginning, not long after its formation, Mars's atmospheric pressure was very high. It was actually about four times what the pressure is here on Earth. And that means that raindrops could not form in any real size. Any rain that was falling would, they think, be more like a mist rather than the kind of rain that we're used to. They reckon an upper limit to the raindrops of about three millimetres at that stage. However, as Mars's climate evolved and Mars's atmosphere evolved, the pressure fell and eventually settled down at about one and a half times the Earth's atmospheric pressure. And it's that Uh, point at which it gets really interesting because the fact that you've got a lower gravity on Mars than you have on Earth but a similar atmospheric pressure means that you can actually form raindrops with a much bigger diameter Mm. than anything you find on Earth and in fact they speculate that these raindrops could be up to 7.3 millimeters in diameter which is getting on for a centimeter that's That's a a pretty hefty drop of water a drop of water, that's right. And so that means that you've got a sort of fairly high intensity of fall, probably combined with the lower gravity, but the bigger raindrops would perhaps give you a very similar kind of erosive power to what rainfall on the Earth would be. Mm. So that's been the suggestion that they've made, that the falls would have been so heavy that, you know, the soil itself couldn't have absorbed the moisture, and then you get these runoff effects and the valley networks and things of that sort being formed, which we see still today. That is all fossilised in the surface of Mars. So these scientists, one from, I think, Johns Hopkins University, the other from the Smithsonian Institute, have basically solved a problem, which is how could you get enough water on Mars falling as rain to make these features, given the lower gravity of the planet? Very interesting stuff. As I said, it's still theory, but I do like the idea of uh, standing in a rain shower on Mars with centimetre-sized drops whizzing past your face. Yeah, you just need a titanium umbrella. (laughs) Yeah, you might. (laughs) Uh, It's just a fascinating planet. I mean, it is smaller than Earth, but uh, geologically it is just a fascinating thing and and the topography is uh, mind-blowing. All its features are just so much bigger than ours. Um, I guess because it's smaller, I don't know. Is that that a... Well, certainly with the volcanic features, you know that the biggest volcano in the solar system is the Olympus Olympus Mons. Mons, That's right. Yes. Which, uh, if I remember rightly, is 27 kilometres vertically from base to top and I suppose since volcanoes grow by spewing material out of their crater or their caldera maybe the lower gravity is why it's such a big volcano because it allows you to build bigger features but uh, remarkable stuff really remarkable what a place and great that we're managing to explore it with uh, rovers and orbiting spacecraft. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. A United States Air Force X-37B space shuttle has returned to Earth following a record-breaking two-year-long mission in orbit. The black and white winged space plane undertook a completely autonomous landing at the Kennedy Space Center on the old space shuttle runway 15 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. After wheel stop on the runway, the orbiter was safed by the Air Force crew before being towed into one of NASA's former space shuttle orbiter processing hangars. The X-37B had been launched on an Atlas V rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape way back on May 20, 2015. As with most X-37B flights, the 718-day mission known as OTV-4 was classified. It included experiments on how different materials survived long-term exposure in space, 
and how a new Aerojet rocket iron experimental hall effect iron electric propulsion system thruster functioned in orbit. US Air Force insists that the reusable space planes are only being used for experimental payload missions. However, it's also thought the orbiters are used for clandestine operations, including spying missions and secret space weapons testing. The Boeing X-37B program began as a joint NASA-US Air Force project in 1999. Back then, the X-37B was supposed to be launched from the payload bay of a manned space shuttle. However, with NASA hit by stringent budget cuts, the Defense Department took over the project in 2004, conducting their first drop tests at the Edwards Air Force Base near Los Angeles in 2006. The space plane's first orbital mission launched on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral on April 22, 2010, testing the orbiter's heat shield and hypersonic aerodynamic handling. We don't know what else it did up there, but it reportedly passed over the same spot of the Earth every four days, operating at an altitude of about 410 kilometres, which is typical for a military surveillance satellite. It finally landed at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California some seven months later on December 3, 2010. A second X-37B was launched from Cape Canaveral, also on an Atlas V rocket, on March 5, 2011. It was described by the US military simply as testing new space technologies. It landed back at Vandenberg on the 16th of June 2012 after almost 469 days in orbit. A third mission, which was the second flight for the original orbiter, launched on an Atlas V from the Cape on December 11, 2012, landing at Vandenberg almost 675 days later on October 17, 2014. The latest mission, which was the fourth overall, was also the second for the second of the two orbiters. As mentioned earlier, all previous missions had landed at Vandenberg, but this one landed at the Kennedy Space Center. By moving the landings to the same base where the two shuttles are being launched from, that should streamline operations, allowing quicker turnaround times between future missions. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine has hit the newsstands, and among its many glossy pages is a spectacular feature on the world's largest telescope, the Square Kilometre Array, a facility spread across two continents which will change astronomy and the way we see the universe forever. Joining us now with all the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. Yeah, Stuart, coming up in the next issue of uh, Australian Sky and Telescope, we've got a really in-depth look at the largest astronomy facility ever built, or should say going to be built. In fact, it's, it's still being built right now. In fact, they've only just started, and it's going to take at least a decade, probably up to 20 years to complete. I'm talking about the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope, or SKA, which is, uh, is or is going to be a network of thousands of different kinds of dishes and other types of antennae, with half of them being built in Australia and the other half being built in southern Africa. Now systems such as these work by combining the outputs from all the different antennae to give you the same effect as having one big one because you can't of course build one that big because only so big you can go. So by scattering lots of little ones around the place and then electronically combining them all together you get the effect of one big one. Now this is called radio interferometry isn't it? Radio interferometry yeah the interferometry interfering it's basically what it means is you get two signals and you when you combine them you make them interfere. That's in in ordinary day-to-day talk, interference sounds bad, but in radio astronomy, interfering is, is good because it means you're, you're amplifying or boosting the, um, the radio signals coming in by taking two or more or thousands of outputs out of different telescopes and combining them together, making them constructively interfere to boost up the, the signal. And this gives you, what, better resolution, doesn't it? There are two things. One is there's sensitivity and there's resolution. Resolution you get from spreading the dishes out over a wide area. The further you've got them apart, that gives you good resolution. The distance between them is called baselines. And when you've got thousands and thousands of them, you can sort of match up thousands and thousands of baselines between different telescopes and sort of like well, on a Chinese checkers board, you know, if you just filled in all the holes with marbles, you've got the whole thing covered. So, yeah, the size of the telescope or the telescope array gives you your resolution, how much detail you can see out in space. Sensitivity, which is how faint you can see or how faint you can hear, comes from how much collecting area you've got with your the different types of antennas, whether they're dishes or other types of antennas. It's like, you know, some animals that, that come out at night when it's all dark and everything and they've got really good sense of hearing they tend to have really big ears so they can catch oh, a lot like of bounces. sound <laughs> bounces <laughs> no no not thick necks uh, big ears um the uh, the, so these little possums and things they've got these really big ears and they can hear very well or they might have big eyes 
uh, to catch more light. Mm. So that's what that's what gives you sensitivity. So we've got you know, small eyes and small ears. Uh, other animals are a lot better than us. So when you combine like a dog up with its big nose, a dog with a, a big nose, it, it can pick up faint scents exactly right. So that's sensitivity. It doesn't and explain with, the Pekingese, but does it? <laughs> nothing explains that one. The sensitivity of a radio telescope is how much collecting area. So with a dish, you know, you've got the sort of circular collecting area, and with other types of antennae, they have different collecting area, if you like. And the idea is that when this is fully completed, the square kilometre array will have one square kilometre of collecting area when you add up all the different antennae put together. That gives you sensitivity. That means you can see really faint things, and further away something is the fainter it is. So the SKA is going to be able to see, you know, a long way out into space. Now, it's being built in two stages. The first, which is going to cost around a billion dollars, and I should say this is an international effort, a billion dollars will see 200 dishes erected in South Africa and thousands of smaller antennae spread out across the desert in the far northwest of Australia. And with this super sensitivity, the SKA is going to be able to see far across space and far back in time to the era not long after the Big Bang and show us what was going on in the cosmos back then in the early years and how it's been evolving since. It's also going to be able to discover all sorts of other things like hundreds or thousands of more pulsars. It's going to map the magnetic field in our galaxy and the gas clouds out there in space that eventually turn into stars and planets. And with this super sensitivity to faint signals, it's also of great interest to the uh, scientists who are interested in trying to pick up radio signals from any other civilizations that might be out there. If there are any out there in our galaxy, this telescope will find them if they are putting out radio waves. Now, that's the big question, of course. If there's someone out there, are they sending out radio waves? But if they are, they're out there like us, even if they have things like this. This telescope was built on a planet elsewhere in our galaxy, and they were looking towards us. They would know that we are here because we are sending out fairly powerful radio signals such as radars and television signals. Those Old kinds episodes of, of I Love Lucy. Old episodes of I Love Lucy and all that sort of stuff beaming out there into space. Goodness knows what they're going to think of us. Anyway, what can you do? So, great stuff. Amazing machines in both Australia and South Africa. What they call precursor telescopes are already there up and running. Sort of, um, you wouldn't call them prototypes as such because they're better than that. That's ASCAP and Meerkat, isn't it? You've got Meerkat in South Africa and you've got a couple of others as well. And here in Australia, you have what's called ASCAP, which is the Australian SKA Pathfinder, which comprises 36 dish antennae, each of them 12 metres wide. We also have here in Australia what's called the Murchison Wide Field Array and it's made up of antennae. This is how I was struggling to describe them a moment ago. They just look like thousands of metre long bits of metal sticking up out of the ground basically. They don't look anything like what you would expect a radio telescope to be but they're incredibly sensitive. Now when the first stage of the square kilometre array is fully built, just the first half of it, the Australian half of it is going to have 130,000 of these smaller antennae spread across the Australian desert. And get this, In terms of data, just that Australian part of it is going to produce as much data in one second as the whole internet did last year. Well, and and that's really a huge problem, isn't it? Because how do you sift through that amount of data? The simple fact is you can't. You've got to develop programs to do the sifting for you. You do, and look, they have to do some of that at the telescope site itself because there's a supercomputer centre that has been built and it's up and running called the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre in Perth. That's the capital city of Western Australia. And the telescopes, or the radio telescopes, are way, way thousands of kilometres up in the desert. So there's a very high capacity fibre pipeline, if you like, a data pipeline that runs from the desert to the coast and then all the way down the coast to Perth. But even that's not good enough to take this amount of data. So they're going to have to do what they call reduce some of the data there on site with super fantastic computers and electronics to squeeze it down a bit and get rid of the the stuff they don't need and send the rest down to the supercomputing centre where one of the world's best supercomputers is and, and they'll continue to upgrade it as the years go by. They've had the same sort of problem with the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a whole interferometer of telescopes spread across the Northern Hemisphere, looking at the centre of our galaxy to try and spot Sagittarius A star. There's so much data coming in on that, they're not even bothering to use online data transfer systems. They're just putting it all on DVDs and Blu-ray and sending it that way. Yeah, well, that's right, because they can hold lots of data. That's good for that, the Event Horizon Telescope. With this SKA, the amount of data is just going mm. to be so huge that even DVDs, you just, just forget yeah. it. You can't do it. I mean, if you had endless money, you could build an enormous computer storage system and you could handle it. But even at a billion dollars, that's not endless money when it comes to this particular 
huge data problem. So yeah, in some instances, they're going to have to throw data away that comes in. They're going to have to take a quick glance at it, see if there's anything in there that strikes them. And if not, it gets dumped and away you go to the next lot. And astronomers have really never had to do that before. Yeah, because uh, keeping do. the old data has always been great because you can then go back and sift through it and mine it for other studies you're working on. A lot of new discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics aren't being made by fresh observations. They're being made by scientists going through old data and looking for new things within that data spiel. That's certainly right. And even when you do have new discoveries, they go back to look at the old observations mm. to see whether they'd missed it beforehand and what they can uh, learn from that. So, no, I don't want to give the impression that they're going to throw all the data away. Of course, they're not doing that. It's just in certain instances they'll, they'll have to do that. Uh, so they'll be storing lots of data. And the good thing about that, too, is with the particular way this radio astronomy works and this thing called interferometry, uh, you can store the data and say that you were looking in a particular direction in the sky, right, and you're interested in that. Well, the data that's coming in and the data you're storing actually is data from every direction in the sky. So you can go back to the data years later and say, okay, well, let's see what it was in the other direction. And bingo, it's there at your fingertips. So it's just going to be absolutely amazing. But I'm just astonished by that data ray. It's going to produce as much in one second as the whole internet did last year. And that's just going to be the Australian half of it. And that's just the first stage. Imagine all the cat videos. <laughs> the cat videos, interstellar cats. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, imagine all the cat videos that are being broadcast out into space. I think it was Arthur C. Clarke actually um, years and years ago. Well, he's, he's dead now, of course but um, a long time ago he wrote a, a story. I'm fairly certain it was him and... Uh, it was from the perspective of aliens who might come to look at Earth. And they would have concluded that either the motor car was the highest form of life on Earth because there were these two-legged animals that, that would drive the cars from here to there to get, them, to get the car from where it, want, where it was to where it wanted to go. And they would probably also conclude that dogs were um, the highest form yeah, of dogs life. dogs were our leaders. Well, these the silly two-legged things that walk along beside the dogs every now and then have to stop with a plastic bag and pick up some stuff from the ground and carry it with them. them. Yeah, so who, who's, who's the smart one, you know? Anyway, uh, off track a little bit there. So, yeah, look, a really in-depth look at this fantastic telescope that they're building in the very remote reaches of Australia and also in southern Africa. Fascinating project, and you can read all about it in Australian Sky and Telescope. We also take a look inside a comet, and we have a look at a star that has seven Earth-like planets, several of which might be suitable for life. No, and we also Trappist show you one, how to, that's called Trappist-1, yep. And we also show you how to take beautiful panoramic shots of the night sky, which is a simple bit of gear you can buy. You can take the most beautiful panoramas of the entire sky. You don't have to be an expert astronomer. You don't have to have telescopes or anything like that. You just attach your camera to it and away you go, produce beautiful photos. So we've got all that and lots more. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at spacetimewithstuartgary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.